Ezekiel, 1 Samuel, and they're looking at, we're going to look at three passages of scriptures uh, that are just within a few pages of each other. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 16, I'm going to use, let's see, Brother Nathan, if I've got that, I don't know if I've got that, I'll just stay right behind the pulpit, that's fine. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 16, 1 Samuel chapter 16, and uh, I want you to look with me at verse number 14, verse number 14 of uh, 1 Samuel, Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse number 14. The Bible says, but the Spirit, notice the big S there, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, thank you, and uh, an evil spirit uh, from the Lord troubled him. Go over now to chapter 18 and verse number 10, chapter 18 of 1 Samuel, and look in verse number 10. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast a javelin, for he said, I will smite David in the wall with it, and David avoided out of his presence twice. And then go to chapter 19, 1 Samuel chapter 19, and then we'll look at this last one in verse number 9. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand. And David played uh, with his hand. He was a harp player. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with a javelin. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence and he smote the javelin to the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the time that we can be in church tonight. And uh, Lord, I do pray for the few moments that we'll have together that you would speak and, and help each of us, Lord, as we look at some things in our life that we need to be aware of, some things we need to guard and protect, and uh, put some safety measures about us, Lord, please help us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated, if you would, please. Three times uh, we see the statement said about an evil spirit uh, that came upon Saul, and uh, three different occasions within uh, just a few short chapters. The Bible is full of wisdom and guidance on how to live, but also contains many cautionary examples of how not to live uh, that we can glean and learn from just as well as we can learn from what was done right. We can learn from what people did wrong. And that's a great thing about the Bible. Uh, it's a perfect book about us, imperfect people. And uh, so it shows the, the frailties and the faults and the shortcomings of us uh, it doesn't take away from the perfection of God's Word, uh, but it gives us some other direction or perspective. We can learn from men like uh, Joseph and, and great men of God, but we can also learn from others that weren't such great men of God, and that uh, we can learn from their other side as well. And so studying these negative examples, we can learn some very valuable lessons about the attitudes and the mindsets uh, that we're to avoid. King Saul started off as a very humble man, and he didn't have much background of what he came from. He had very, very simple, simple background, very humble man. Uh, but God gave him many victories as a king, as a leader of his army there. And uh, through those many victories, we see that pride uh, and jealousy began to corrupt uh, Saul over a period of time. Uh, jealousy in particular towards David. Uh, we see here where David uh, had done some great feats as well. God had blessed David in these couple of occasions where he had the javelin in his hand and threw it at David. It was all a result of jealousy uh, because uh, David uh, was getting more praise and recognition and, and more accolades from everybody else than he thought that he deserved more. And so there was that, uh, uh, that jealousy spirit that was there uh, as a part of that. And so uh, he was jealous of David's success and David's popularity. And uh, Saul became consumed, consumed uh, with killing uh, David. Uh, Saul's jealousy blinded him to his own disobedience to God. And that's one of the things that, that's so important about our spirit is that uh, if we don't guard our spirit, it's so easy for our own disobedience to cause us not to see our own imperfections. And uh, it's sort of like, you know, you're looking at the splinter in somebody else's eye, and uh, you don't see the big log, the big beam, the, you know, the moat that's in your eye. And it's so easy for me to come and pick out the little sliver in your eye 
and uh, have no awareness at all that I've got any problem in my life. And uh, we're all sort of prone to do that. Saul was an example as well of uh, the same thing. And so King Saul was the first king of Israel after uh, repeated acts of disobedience to God, uh, where God had told him to do it one way, and Saul did not do it the, the way that God told him to do it. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, 14, it says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. An evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now Saul had lived a life of chronic disobedience to God, and therefore at this time he could have opened himself up uh, to demonic influence and demonic oppression. We don't know all the details about uh, things that took place in the child of God. You can never be possessed, uh, demonically possessed. Uh, once you're a child of God and God is on the inside, there's no way that that demonic possession can take place. But we can be demonic oppressed. And a demonic influence and oppression is just sort of like a choking. Like if I was to come around and give you a big bear hug uh, from behind and oppress your arms from moving and oppress you from, from you know, uh, being uh, able to get about. Uh, the, the, the demonic influence in our life can certainly do that. And so that could have been uh, something through his disobedience and that uh, he was open to that demonic oppression. But the evil spirit that came upon him could also, uh, may well have been his own bad attitude, his ugly disposition that manifested itself over and over again to where we find him being his own worst enemy. And many times in our own lives, aren't we our own worst enemies? And uh, we're our own worst critic, and we beat ourselves up more than everybody else. And, and so I don't know, we don't know all the details, but we do know that this evil spirit undoubtedly had, an, had, a, had a negative effect on his spirit. And it wasn't something that was very conducive of God's blessings on his life at all. And so he bore the total responsibility for all of his actions, uh, though, uh, though we see that this evil spirit was upon him. Now I want you to take your Bible and go to Job chapter number 1. With that sort of as a little uh, preface, I want you to jump over to the book of Job uh, chapter number 1. And uh, we'll look at verse number 1. Job chapter 1, verse number 1. And so three times it was said of, of Saul that that evil spirit, uh, and that evil spirit undoubtedly had an effect on his spirit, uh, had a negative effect on his spirit, and it was through the jealousy and continued disobedience that he had, Saul had towards God. Now in Job chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says there was a man in the land of Uz, the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, one that feared God, no sound, and eschewed evil. And eschewed evil. Now in the opening verse of Job, we're given uh, certain characteristics about Job that, uh, that features this man that God bragged on Job about. Four attributes of Job that caught God's attention. Uh, that God says, hey, you, you see that guy down there? And he lists four different qualities of that individual. We see the first one, it says Job is a... Perfect man. Perfect doesn't mean sinless, but it means there was a maturity there. There was a balance there. And it's so easy for all of us to excel in one area of our life at the expense of other areas being neglected. And so to be perfect or to be mature uh, is to be balanced. Uh, as a Christian, we're to grow proportionally, not individually. So uh, if I was, if as a child growing, if the only thing that grew an individual was just the arm, and the arm grew to maturity over the right process of time, but the rest of the body remained uh, immature and uh, childish or childlike, uh, we would look and say, well, that's a, that's a disformed body. That's not the way you're supposed to grow. Everything grows proportionally. And so the same thing with a Christian. God doesn't just want us to grow in our Bible reading, or God doesn't just want us to grow uh, in, uh, in our soul reading, and God is just, just wants to grow just in this area, prayer life. God wants to to grow proportionally in all areas of our life. And so that's what the word perfect means, or mature or balanced in his life. And so Job was a man that was balanced. He was growing in all areas of his life. Uh, we also see that God uh, commended him or bragged about uh, him being an upright man. In other words, Job was honest in all that he did. He was a man of integrity. His word was good. And uh, he was an upright man. I mean, he was above reproach. Uh, he avoided the appearance of evil. I mean, he wasn't someone that just walked the, 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 the line and, and just sort of skirted the, the trail. I mean, he was very obvious, an upright man, an honest man, trustworthy. God also says in notice of Job, he said he feared God. 
And uh, Job's view of God caused him to fear God, uh, which is probably why God had such a, a respect for Job, because there was that fear of God that he had. And we ought never to grow out of that understanding that we serve a holy God and a righteous God. And it's not just a, a solemn respect for God, but it is a fear of God, realizing that God's a creator of all things, and we better walk circumspectly in the sight of understanding the holiness of that God. Then he says the fourth characteristic caught God's attention was that it says he eschewed evil. It did not say that he eschewed sin, but it did say he eschewed evil. Now, this evil spirit that came upon Saul three different occasions, and then now we see Job was commended or complimented by God because he eschewed not sin, but evil. And so there's a difference between sin and and evil. Uh, in our Bibles, you don't have to turn there for the sake of time, but in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says, Out of the ground may the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It doesn't say good and sin. It says good and evil. We also see in Genesis 2, 17, But the tree of the knowledge of good and and evil. God says, Thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Genesis 3 5 says, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, you shall be as God's, knowing good and evil. And then in Genesis 3 22, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now let us put him forth his hand. Uh, take, take also the tree of life and eat and live uh, forever. And so notice it was not the tree of the knowledge of good and sin. It was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Good and evil. And so Satan wants you to sin. But much more than that, he wants us to be evil. And that, that evil a uh, spirit that we've got to guard against to becoming uh, having an evil spirit that uh, would not is it, it, sin. Evil is sin, but uh, but evil is much more uh, uh, severe because it's not just a sin that hurts myself. Evil is a sin that's done with the intent to hurt someone else and to bring harm to someone else. Every time they're mentioned together, the word good uh, and evil. Thirty-four times in the Bible, you'll see that little phrase: good and evil. Good and evil. Now the word good there is not referencing being good. It's referencing doing good. And so God says, do good and, uh, and evil's together. Don't be good, but do good. And uh, so when they're tied together, they're tied in that way. And so speaking of doing good to someone, there's always a beneficiary of the good that you're to do. It doesn't mean being a good person, but rather it means to do some good deeds. Take your Bibles and go to Psalm 51. And notice in verse number 4, as we have the psalm of David after his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah, the sin of, of uh, putting him in the front lines. And, of course, uh, God confronting uh, David at this time. And, and Samuel, of course. And, of course, a story here. But look in Psalm 51, verse 4, as we see the difference between sin and evil. In verse 4, it says, again, David says unto God, against thee and thee only, notice now, have I sinned. Okay, so that word sin, and done this evil in thy sight. So we see two different words meaning different things, but in the same context. But thou knowest that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear uh, when thou judgest. So in the moment of passion that David sinned against Bathsheba, uh, it, it was a sin. But the premeditated murder of Uriah, it was plotted, it was planned, it was organized, it was structured, and he made sure Uriah went to the front lines for the battle with a sole intent that he would be shot because he's on the front line. God, and so David's dealing with what? His sin that was done, that was wrong, uh, a transgression, a missing of the mark against God, but the evil that he did was the hurt that he did on purpose of that sin to bring harm and hurt to Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. David's sin was the act of adultery of Bathsheba. David's evil was a planned act of having Uriah killed. It was worse for David to conspire to kill Uriah than it was for him to fall uh, into adultery, into sin and adultery. Both were terrible sins, but the evil was the most wicked of offenses, as we'll see in a moment. Look in Genesis chapter 8, uh, or uh, chapter, uh, yeah, chapter 6, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 6 and, and verse number 5. Bible says, And God saw 
God saw that the wickedness of man was great. All right? That's the sin. Wickedness is the sin. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And notice how. And that every, Genesis 6, 5. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was what? Only evil continually. So God saw the wickedness of man upon the earth. That was sin. But God saw that every imagination of their heart was continually what? It was evil continuing. Why did God uh, bring about the flood? Why did God destroy the world? Because of evil. Because of evil. Man is sinful. We understand that. All of sin it comes short of the glory of God. And so anytime God destroyed a people, he did not do it because they were a sinner. He did it because they were evil in their intent. Because they were doing evil. If they had just been sinning, they would not have been destroyed as that. Now we understand, behold, thou, thou sinnest, uh, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. We understand the consequence of sin, the wage of sin is death. But in regards to the punishment that comes in the areas of living life day in and day out, the evilness that comes, sin is missing the mark. Evil is a sin which injures another person. Sin is doing wrong. Evil is doing wrong with the intent to bring hurt and harm to someone else. Uh, drinking alcohol is sin. Serving alcohol is evil. Uh, drinking uh, uh, or smoking cigarettes is sin. Selling cigarettes is evil. Why? Because you're doing something that's going to be harmful and hurtful to someone else. Now, you do it to yourself. That's sin. We do it for someone else. That's evil. So we see, behold the tree of knowledge of, not sin, but good and evil. And so evil is a sin of bringing harm to someone else when you sin. Even if a person deserves to be hurt, we're never justified in hurting them. Why? Vengeance is mine, God says. I'll repay. Listen, you got to give it to God and uh, let God take care of your enemies. Let God take care of the injustices. Let God take care of the hurts in your life. You do the right thing. Uh, and uh, in doing the right thing, God says, don't do any time, at any instance, no one, even though they deserve it, we never should find ourselves in a position where we're trying to hurt someone else. That's evil, and that's a whole different category or classification of taking sin to a level that God uh, does not look very uh, uh, lightly upon. Now, vengeance belongs to God. Job, though, the Bible says, is skewed, evil. Now, skewed means doing anything that would hurt others. If eschewing evil was noticed by God, then we better know what eschew means. And uh, he said, listen, look at Job. He's a perfect man. Look at Job. He's upright. Look at Job. I mean, he fears God. He fears me. Look at Job. He eschews. Now, those are the qualities that God highlighted. Those should be some qualities that ought to be highlighted in our lives. What does it mean to see this word eschewed? The word eschewed is only used three times in the Old Testament, and each of those three times it references Job. Each time it talks about uh, the story of Job or the life of Job uh, in Job chapter 1 and verse 1. And uh, look in verse number, uh, go back, let's go to, to well, I'm going to take time, we won't go there. But Job chapter 1 verse 1, and then chapter 1 verse 8, and then chapter 2 verse 8. Each time the Bible says, Job did what? He eschewed evil. He eschewed evil. What does that mean? What's it mean to eschew evil? Simon Peter uh, used this word in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, for he says, For he that will love life, he that loves life and will see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Again, notice, it's not be good, it's do good. And he says, what's he got to do? If you want a good life, you want a happy life, God says you better eschew evil. Don't let your tongue speak evil, and then you eschew evil. So if anyone desires those good days, we've got to eschew evil. Even in our speech, we've got to speak good, and we've got to do good, and we've got to make sure we're not finding ourselves in a position of being evil, being evil, doing wrong with the intent not just to hurt myself, but also uh, of hurting others. Now, the root of the word, uh, askewed, is an old German word. All right, Brother Nikolai, it's an old German word, and uh, meaning shy. The German verb is, uh, is uh, schun, S-C-H-E-U-E-N, schun, and uh, meaning to shun something. It means to abstain from, to steer clear of, to have nothing to do with something. In other words, God loved that Job, in all his power, and all his strength, did everything he could to what? Avoid 
evil. He didn't hang out with it, didn't associate with it, didn't, didn't tolerate it. He eschewed it. He got as far away from it as he possibly could. And so if eschewing evil is an attribute that God admires, that God brags upon, and that God highlighted in the life of Job, then it would be better for each of us to also have those same qualities or that same quality in our lives. So let me give you some ways tonight uh, that we can eschew evil. Ways that we can eschew evil. I think first off, uh, we can eschew evil uh, when we avoid uh, being that source of evil. Uh, you should do everything in your power never to retaliate in a manner that is going to be hurtful to someone. Well, they hurt me, but that gives you no justification to hurt them. And well, they were unkind to me. That gives you no justification. But they were uh, uh, unjust to me. That wasn't fair. That wasn't right. Uh, listen, uh, no matter how much hurt someone causes you, it's never right for us to intend to hurt someone else. And that's evil. And God says, Job, he eschewed evil. Boy, he didn't look for a way to hurt someone. He was looking for a way to overcome the evil that was directed to him and to put it to a halt uh, in his own life. Uh, it does not matter uh, what someone has done to you. You should abstain. You should stay clear of doing anything to someone with the intent to hurt them. Uh, you should never be the source that intends to hurt someone no matter what they've done to you. But it was so unkind. It was so unfair. It was so unjust. It was so unhurtful. Now, our human nature is what? To retaliate. Boy, I'm going to get you back. I'm going to hurt you. You hurt me. I'm going to hurt you. You were unc- I'm going to get back at you. And God says, hold it. Hold it. Uh, their hearts were what? Evil continue. What brought the flood? The evil, continual evil. The intent. The now, let me say, secondly, not only is that uh, avoiding the source, but also we don't want to be the one that's the carrier of evil. Uh, you don't want to be the one that transports from, uh, from, the, from the ear to what you heard uh, to, to speak at, uh, to someone else to hear. There's a difference between being the source of evil and being the carrier of evil. To be the carrier of evil uh, is to then take through your tongue and say to others something that's hurtful about someone else. Uh, God says, don't do that. We saw in 1 Peter, he says, listen, you want to live good days? Uh, you want to live a life that's good? He said, let's what? Refrain his tongue from what? Evil. Don't say something. Don't talk evil. Don't, don't hurt someone with your voice. Don't hurt someone with what you talk to them about. You criticize them. You're negative about them. You beat them up with your mouth. Don't do it. God says that's evil. And so Job eschewed evil. But it's also not just being a carrier with our tongue. It's also nowadays uh, with our fingers on, uh, on the keyboard, through social media and through blog posts and, and the different things of that nature. There's a lot of folks that may not say something with their tongue, but they type a lot on the social media with their fingers. It matters not what the vehicle you use to carry evil. It's evil to spread something hurtful about someone else. And then let me say this. You avoid being the consumer of evil uh, if you, can, if you uh, eschew evil. You've got to avoid being the vehicle to spread it, but also you've got to understand, uh, I don't I want to avoid uh, the environment to where I'll find myself being the recipient of evil. i, I got to stay away from it. I, I can't put myself, listen, I've got to guard my spirit. I don't want that evil spirit. I don't want to have an evil spirit where I want to hurt you. You hurt me, and I want to hurt you. You hurt my kids. I want to hurt you. You hurt this. I want to hurt you. I've got, I don't want that spirit that's going to affect and infect my life and wreck and ruin my home. I've got to guard my spirit. I don't want that evil spirit uh, to come forth. And so I've got to guard uh, avoiding the platform and the person that chooses to spread and do evil. Take your Bibles and go to Psalm 140 and verse number 1. Psalm 140, verse number 1. Now this thought of, 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 of evil and the evil spirit we've got to be very careful with because our human nature uh, is to, uh, to find ourselves associating, uh, hanging out with, and uh, certainly not eschewing uh, those that are speaking hurtful things uh, about others. Psalm 140, and uh, verse 1, the thought is given. He says in the prayer, deliver me, O Lord, from what? The evil man. Deliver me. I don't want to be around an evil person. I don't want to associate uh, with an evil person. Listen, you cannot associate with someone who's plotting to hurt someone else and not affect you. Uh, but it's not against me. They're not plotting to hurt me. Uh, they're not talking about me. No, but if you're associating with that evil person, you're going to get hurt by that. You're going to get the overflow that you cannot put yourself in a position, in a platform where a person is 
that's hurting wants to hurt someone else. That's not a safe place for you to be. You're not to fellowship with evil people. You're not to allow them uh, to preach for you or to preach with them. And uh, we're to guard ourselves from being around people that are evil. Why? It's going to affect me. I want to become like the people I associate with. If I'm hanging out with people that are talking and, and speaking and intending to hurt someone else, it's going to have an effect on me. And I don't want that effect. I don't want to have an evil spirit. I don't want to have a spirit that wants to retaliate. I don't want to have a spirit that says, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. You were unkind to me, I'm going to be unkind to you. You were mean to me, I'm going to be mean to you. I don't want that kind of spirit. I've got to guard my spirit. Take your Bibles and go to Revelation. All the way back to our New Testament, Revelation chapter 2. And look in verse uh, number 1. In verse number 2, Revelation. Uh, of course, uh, uh, John is referencing, and Jesus referencing here uh, as he references the churches. And uh, we see in Revelation chapter uh, number 2, uh, look in verse, beginning in verse number 1, last chapter there, or last book in the Bible, Revelation 2, verse 1. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that upholdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Now the stars are the preachers. Those are the pastors. So God says, I hold the preachers in my right hand. Who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. The golden candlesticks are the churches. And so God says, I've got the preachers in my hand. And he said, I'm walking through the, the midst of the churches, the candlesticks. And he said, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. But notice what Jesus says. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they're apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. That word bear, thou canst not bear them which are evil, means to hold up. They could not hold up under the load of those who are evil. The church at Ephesus would not associate with those, and God complimented with that. He said, listen, he said, I'm walking through your church, and I hold the preachers in my hand, and I'm walking through the church, and I've got something to say about you. You're doing, he said, I know your works, I know your labor, I know your patience, but also know this, I know you don't bear, you don't associate, you don't hang out, you don't listen, you don't give ear to you. Those that want to hurt people, those that want to hurt others, you give them no time and attention. He says, that's a good thing to do because you're protecting your spirit from becoming an evil spirit that will hurt others. Uh, and so the church of Ephesus uh, said that you, you don't bear them. You don't bear them. So the church is to reach every sinner possible that we possibly can. We're to lift up the fallen as we can. We're to bring reach every drunkard, every harlot, every drug addict, every fallen sinner that we can. But we're not to bear with those and associate with those who are evil never one time. Jesus was a friend of sinners. But you'll never find him associating with those that were evil. And there's a difference. Why? God says you, you don't spend time, you don't associate, you don't hang out with those that have an intention to hurt someone else. You're hurting yourself. You're putting yourself in a very dangerous environment. You're violating what God says will protect your spirit from becoming an evil spirit where you'll then want to retaliate and do something that would hurt. Because our natural tendency, you hurt me, I want to hurt you. You hurt someone I love, I want to hurt you in return. And so we ought not to be that way. We're not to treat people who sin in the same way uh, that the people, uh, that uh, they do evil. God said, listen, sinners are going to be sinful. But evil people, listen, don't waste your time with evil people. Don't give them a time of day. Listen, the folks that need your help, the folks that need your influence, the folks that need your interaction are the sinners. And Jesus says, listen, uh, the, the sinners, I've come to reach the sinners. I'm a friend. I love the sinners. But you won't find Jesus uh, hobnobbing, uh, trying to reach and minister uh, to the evil people. I preach about the importance of salvaging people who have gone to the depths of alcoholism, of drug addiction, fornication, adultery. Jesus was a friend of people like these, but he was not a friend of evil people. In fact, he rebuked them. He spoke harshly of the scribes and Pharisees because they're evil and conspired to hurt others. He said, listen, don't, don't, you, don't, don't listen. Don't hang out. Don't put yourself in a position where you're the recipient of someone that's speaking, that's talking, that's doing things, that's trying to hurt someone else. Listen, you can't, the only one that can control that is you. And we're so prone to be drawn in because we feel that we're, they're confiding in us. 
We feel so special because they're entrusting this information to us. Uh, we feel so privileged that they would share this inner uh, information to us about somebody else. And all the while, we don't realize, listen, they're there to defile and to hurt. And God says, don't, listen, there's no hope for those that want to hurt others. He said, listen, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going, to get, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot if you try to, to minister and to help those that are in the intention of trying to hurt others. And so God says you've got to guard that. Go to Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2, he says, so I'm proud of you, church, Ephesus. He says, boy, you're a working church. You're a laboring church. You're hardworking. Boy, I'm proud of you. But you also, I'm proud of this. You don't put up with evil people. And you don't put up with folks that are, are trying to undermine and trying to hurt and trying to go by people's backs and trying to say things that are unkind and, and hurtful and, and uh, 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 they're trying to bring about vengeance or vindictive attitude. He said, I don't want that. Look in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 11. For Proverbs chapter 2, verse 11. Discretion shall preserve thee. Understanding shall keep thee to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things. You see, discretion, understanding should deliver you from being associated with evil people. He said, listen, I mean, it's just common sense. I mean, it's just, it's just don't you understand? If someone's wanting to hurt someone, uh, that, uh, that you don't want to be privy to that. You don't want to be a recipient of that. You don't want to be a vehicle of that, a source of that, a carrier of that. You don't want to be a part of that situation. Uh, you don't want to put yourself in that position. Look in Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, uh, look in verse number 15. So the Bible says if you have any common sense at all, any discretion, any understanding, then you're not going to run with those uh, that want to hurt people. Proverbs 4, 14. Proverbs 4, 14. Enter not in the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, pass away. That, that's a lot of, uh, of things about avoiding. He says don't go in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it. Pass away. He says, go the long way home. Uh, don't go the shortcut. Don't go that route. Don't go that route. Because that's an evil person. And evil people want to, how do you know someone's evil? Because they want to hurt someone. They hurt by what they say. They hurt by what they write. They hurt by what they do in the tents to hurt someone else. God says, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't hang out. And they go say, pass on away. For they sleep not, except they have done mischief. And their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. Now, who are these evil people? These evil men, they're in the way. Uh, they're the people trying to hurt someone for every reason. It's evil, and we're not to associate with those type of people. We're not to get it. I want to guard my spirit. And if I'm going to guard my spirit, I can't have an evil spirit. An evil spirit is where we want to do something that hurts someone else, undermines someone else, be critical of someone else, be sarcastic to someone else, a little innuendo here, a little dig here, a little, that's hurt. That's evil. That's evil. And, and God says, don't have any, any part of uh, that at all uh, in your life. And, and so we see uh, there's folks that, that uh, we can see in our lives. Then let me say that lastly, you'll st- you ought to stay as far away from evil as you can. Sad to say, oftentimes as Christians, we live as close to evil as we can. The goal should be to be as close to God as we can, not as close uh, to evil. A person cannot live above sin, but he can prevent himself from being around and being evil. I'm a sinner, but I don't have to be evil. I don't have to allow that, I don't have to allow that sin to cause me to become evil. Um, you see, it, that's a great goal for us. Uh, we cannot reach a place in our lives where we do not sin, but we can determine not to do evil. Here's what happens. Sin left alone, sin not dealt with properly, sin not confessed, sin not done rightly will lead to evil. That's why you got to deal with your sin. Because if you don't deal with your sin, that sin will give birth to evil. Now, sin is hurtful to me as a sinner. But evil is when I do the sin with the intent to hurt somebody else. Uh, you see, uh, if you uh, leave the sin unconfessed, it will fester and eventually lead you to evil. It will stir up on the inside. It will fester. It'll build up that animosity, that anger, that resentment, that unforgiveness, that bitterness, that, that, that vengeance, that retaliation. It'll build, it'll fester on the inside if you don't deal with it rightly. Uh, you have a period of time after you sin before that sin becomes evil. I don't know what that period of time is, but there's a segment of time that you have, the time that, but that you sin and you don't deal with that sin properly where that sin will then give birth to evil. 
Evil will sooner or later come if you don't get the sin forgiven in your life. God allows you a certain amount of time between the act of sin and the time that sin progresses to become evil. Uh, become, become evil. There's a time between your initial anger at a person and the time you want to hurt that person. There's a time between that. And God says you better take care of the anger you have of the person. If you don't take care of the anger, then you're the anger that's going to fester is going to want to hurt someone. You've got to deal with it. And you'll, you'll find that, that evil people, are, 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 are the, they are the way they are because they didn't deal with the sin that was done to them or the hurt that was done to them. They didn't deal with it properly. And in so doing, they allowed that evil to begin to spread like a cancer in their own heart. Now, take your Bibles and go to Romans chapter 12 in verse number 21. The, 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 the cause for evil in a person's life is good. The cause for evil in a person's life is good. The more good you do, the more evil you'll be exposed to. The more the devil will use others to hurt you. Okay? The more, if you don't do any good, then there's no need for the devil to hurt you with evil people because you're not doing good. How, so what's good and evil? It's used what, comparatively together. There's always a beneficiary to good. It's not, are you being good or are you doing good? Are there actions of good that you're doing? And so uh, good is always that which produces evil. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 21. It's not only the cause, but it's also the cure for evil. Romans 12, 21 says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with what? Good. And so the very cause of why evil is coming your way because they're trying to hurt you is the good you're doing. You're trying to do good, and you've got people in your family. They're trying to hurt you and undermine what you're doing and trying to hurt the progress you're making. Why? Because they, they see the good, and that good makes them feel uncomfortable, it makes them feel guilty, it makes them feel bad. And so they attack you because you're doing good. And so they're, they're hurtful to you. They're evil. And so how do you overcome the evil? Now, the tendency is to retaliate and to, to do to them what they've done to us. Now we're no better than them because we have done to them what they've done to us. And God says, they're evil, because, they're evil to you because you're doing good. How do you overcome evil? You do more good. You do more good. And you just keep on doing more good. And so uh, you don't overcome evil with sympathy and self-pity. You overcome evil with good. Do not resort to evil to overcome evil because it will never work. You'll become evil in the process. You'll hurt only yourself. You overcome evil with good. And so you have victory over evil only by doing good. That's why it says give a cup of cool water the least of these and uh, pray for your enemies and do good to those that spitefully use you. Why? Do good to those that spitefully use you. Do good to those who are hurting you. Do good to those who are evil against you. Why? Because you don't want to become evil to those who are being evil to you. So what do you do? You do good. You speak good of them. You talk good of them. Oh, they're talking bad about you. They're being negative about you. They're being hurtful about you. But you don't want that evil that infects your heart. So you become evil in return response to what evil you're receiving. Keep on doing good. Keep on helping the, the hurting. Keep on helping the needy. Reaching out to the lost. That's the only way you'll overcome good. You'll never overcome good when you stop doing good. That's what evil wants you to do. It wants you like Sam Bannon and Tobiah. When Nehemiah wants him to come down from the wall and fight the battle. He said, no, I must build the wall. I've got to build the wall. There's a life to build. There's souls to be saved. I don't have time to fight evil with evil. I just keep on doing good. I keep on doing good. So don't attack the evil. Don't organize a warfare against the evildoer. Uh, you have, in other words, if you do, you've joined in their sin, uh, in their evil. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 8 says, Finally be of all one mind, having compassion one of another. Love his brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil. 1 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9. God says, don't you render evil for evil. But they hurt me. Don't you render evil for evil. But they were unkind. Don't you be render evil. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. Listen, what destroyed the world was the evil continually. David said, I've sinned and I've done this evil in thy sight. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man. See that none, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. God says, I don't care what they've done to you. 
I don't care how much hurt they've caused you. I don't care what they've said about you. I don't care how untrue it's been. I don't care how unjust it's been. I don't care how uh, hurtful it's been. I don't care what evil's been done to you. Don't you ever retaliate evil with evil unto anyone. Don't do it to anyone. So life's too short to let evil be a part of our lives, our spirit. Whatever, whether we be doing it or spreading it or consuming it or, or uh, uh, being in that environment, listen, life's too short. We'll always fight sin as long as we can, but we always must avoid the presence of evil in our lives. Evil should have no place in your life when your life is about spreading the good. That's why the gospel is called the good news. And so God says, do something good today. Do something good today. People are evil. People are hurtful. Because you're doing good. They're doing, you're doing good. Your coworkers are, are mean to you because you know why? You're doing good. You're a hard worker. You got good work ethics. You show up in time. You do the job the way it ought to be. You're doing a good job. And so your other coworkers, you're making them look bad. And so what? They're trying to hurt you. They're trying to hurt you and undermine you. And so what's God say? You just, you just keep doing good. You just keep doing good. Keep doing good. And so things will come in our life. When you do good, you become a magnet for evil, for hurt, because the devil wants to distract you so you don't, you slow up doing good, you, you stop doing good, and you begin to fight the evil, and now you've put yourself in a position to where you're allowing that evil to draw you in, and the good is not being done, and when good is not being done, God can't accomplish his work through us in a powerful way. An evil spirit, three times was, was sent by to Saul, uh, by God. And, and again, it may have been demonic oppression. It might have been demonic influence. It might have been a result of, of his own disobedience to God. They created just that bad spirit that he had, that jealous spirit. And it just created an environment to where he just wanted to retaliate and hurt someone because he was hurt. And he never dealt with his hurt rightly. And if we don't deal with our life's hurt correctly, then that hurt will begin to, 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 begin to fester and cause us to then want to hurt others. You've all been hurt. You've all been hurt. We've all been hurt. But I don't want that hurt to cause me to ever want to hurt someone else. And what I say, or what I do, or how I act, or how I treat them, or what I type, or what I say, I don't want that. I don't want that. Uh, because that's what Satan wants. He wants me to do what they've done to me to hurt me. Well, I'll tell you, and I'm going to hurt you. We see it in marriages. A husband says something unkind to a wife and hurts her feelings, and, and she says something in turn to hurt him, and he says something back, and there's back and forth jockeying position, hurtful this, hurtful that, hurtful that. Listen, you're creating an evil spirit, evil spirit. And there's many of us tonight, we need to say, God, I am so sorry. I don't want to be a person that has an evil spirit that just is looking for ways to hurt someone. I don't want to say something to hurt someone. I don't want to listen to something that's hurtful of someone else. I don't want to do that. i got to protect my spirit. you got to protect your spirit. Thank you, Father, for tonight. I pray you'd help all of us, each of us individually.